she died, and we had a funeral. My Uncle Mort, husband of the deceased, said... A bus. Fancy falling off a bus. Why couldn't she have fallen off a tram and gone out in style? At ten to six, he packed us all off home. He wanted to hear the weather forecast in peace and quiet. My mother said... Your Uncle Mort took it very well, I thought, Carter. Mm. Particularly as the individual trifles wasn't up to much. Mm. I remember as well as out the day your Uncle Mort brought your Aunt Edna home for the first time. My dad said, Well then, lass, sit thee down. We'll not bite thee. <laughs> he was like that with my dad. I do remember him, Carter. Of course I do. He stood six foot three in his stocking feet. Mm. It was the war what killed him off. He never got over Hitler invading Poland. He were a stickler for treaty obligations with my dad. Shortly after Christmas, Uncle Mort sold up and came to live in our house. My dad said... How do, Mort? How do, Les? We had pickled onions and Cheshire cheese for supper that night. Nothing much happened during the summer. There was a bit of rain, there was a bit of sun. There usually was in our part of the world. In September, my Uncle Bob was fatally injured in a piano accident. My mother said... Well, he was always very musical, wasn't he? Two weeks later, his widow, Auntie Lil, sold up and came to live in our house. My Uncle Mort said... What have you got in that bloody great trunk, Lil? My memories, Mort. All my memories are in this trunk. Oh, aye. All I need for mine is a medium-sized wallet. We had pickled onions and Cheshire cheese for supper that night. On Friday, my car broke down, clutch trouble. So on Saturday, I had to take my girlfriend, Pat, be bus to the pictures. We had two chock ices, and I put my hand up the front of her jumper. Pat said... Oh, lovely, Carter. Gorgeous. That's the best chock ice I've had in months. On the way home, it rained. I got drenched. Pat's mother, Mrs Partington, said... Carter, lad, you wet through. You look like a drowned rat. Look at your trousers. They're soaked to the skin. Come on, you best take them off and I'll dry them for you. I will, then. But no arguing. Do as you're told. You can wear a pair of my late husband's gardening pants. He used to grow the most wonderful begonias in them pants, did my late husband. I went into the front parlour and put his pants on. Mrs Partington knocked on the door. Are you decent, Carter? Have you mustered the fly buttons? Yes. Right then, Pat, you can go in and join him. Thank you, Mother. Good night. Good night, love. Have a nice time and be careful what you do in front of your dad's pants. Pat came into the front parlour and sat down on the sofa beside me. She switched off the light. I put my hand up the front of her jumper. Oh, Carter, I do love you. I do. Honest. Mm. Carter. What? Would you like to marry me? Oh, I wouldn't mind. Oh, darling, I thought you was never going to ask me. I thought you was only going out with me to muck around. Hmm? We'll buy the engagement ring next week. Would you like a solitaire or shall you plump for a cluster? Please yourself. Oh, Carter, you're so passionate. You can take me bra off if you like. Oh, ta very much. I put my hands softly on her breasts. They wobbled. Oh, Carter. Oh, darling. Isn't it all so romantic? What? You proposing to me wearing my dad's trousers. A week later, Uncle Mort moved into Auntie Lil's bedroom. It's only sensible, really, Les. I mean, it'll save on the laundry, and I'm ought to be right good company for Lil. Oh, ah. They'll make a perfect couple in bed, her in her plastic curlers and him in his fair hard bed socks. We had pickled onions and Cheshire cheese for supper. When we'd finished, Uncle Mort yawned deeply, looked out of the window and said... By God, it's a raw night. I pity them poor devils what's got to be out working on a night like this. Give me a nice warm bed any time. Well, you've got one upstairs, Mort. I've put three hot water bottles in and I've had dogs sleeping under Ida down all afternoon. Thank you very much, Annie. Aye, ta very much. It's years since I slept with a good hot water bottle. They went upstairs to bed. We heard the clump of Uncle Mort's boots on the ceiling above. We heard the slow rattle of the window sash. We heard the gentle squeak of the springs as they settled themselves in bed. Then there was silence. Are you happy sleeping on that side of the bed, Lil? Oh, yes. 
I always used to sleep on the right-hand side of the bed with my bob. Grand. That's the side you're sleeping on now, then. Yes. But I'm right next to the door, aren't I? I might get a draught in my ears. Mm, all right, well, <coughs> sleep on the other side. I'm not bothered. Yes, but that's in a direct line with the window, isn't it? Well, you'll have to sleep on one side of bed at the other, Lil. It's only human nature, is that? Them's precisely the sentiments of my Bob. He was a student of human nature, was my Bob. Was he, Lil? Oh, yes. Well, there wasn't much else to study in our household once we'd had the arms to put to sleep. The weeks passed by. So did the months. Well, they usually do in our part of the world. April gave way to May. And on a cool Sunday morning, aghast with bacon fat, Uncle Mort made a momentous announcement. <coughs> uh, our Lil is going to have a baby. You what? Well... Putting it in medical terms, our Lil is up the spout. At all time alive? Yes. You all ran. She went to the doctors yesterday and he told her the news. She told me she was going to see about her bunions. That's what she told me. You're a disgrace to the family. Hmm? If the authorities find out what you've been up to, they'll take your old age pension book away from you. You're not allowed to do things like that when you're a senior citizen, you know. Oh. They never told me that in post office. Well, there's only one thing to be done. You'll have to get married. Oh, aye. You've got to do right by a mort. Oh, dear. You ought to be ashamed of yourself, our mort, getting Lil into trouble at your age. You're old enough to be the baby's father. I didn't mean it. Ah, I've heard that before. You just didn't stop and think, did you? If you wanted to while away the time in bed, why didn't you take up fret work? Oh, don't go on like that, Annie. Mm, I suppose I'd best go upstairs and see our Lil. What I'll say to her, I, I just don't know. <laughs> well, <laughs> you old ram. I didn't think you got it in you. Neither did I. You must be the oldest bloody juvenile delinquent in town. I were only trying to keep warm. It were Lil that kept egging me on. A shotgun wedding at your age. <laughs> you, you're not setting our cart on a good example, are you? <laughs> oh, dear, I wish I'd never done it. Auntie Lil rose from her bed in the afternoon. She came down to the front parlour. She sat on the edge of the sofa with her eyes lowered. A baby. It's what I've always wanted. Wow. If it makes you happy, Lily, it's favourite with us. My Bob and I always wanted a baby. It was his one big regret we didn't have his shoe. He'll likely give all the angels a bit of a twang on his heart then, won't he, Lil? I shall always think of that baby as belonging to my Bob. Where do I come into it, then? I knew he was there, in spirit, when the baby was conceived. Mm, I wonder what that bloody draft was down back of me neck. Yes, well, uh, I'm right glad for both of you. But now we've got to get down to brass tacks, haven't we? Aye, no, we can't have you turning into one of them unmarried mothers, Lil. So it's up to you, Mort. Come on, stop sucking the sleeve of your cardigan and do your stuff. <coughs> oh, right, oh. <coughs> Will you marry me, Lil? Yes. Ta very much. Oh, ain't life romantic? <laughs> it's made me go all weak at the knees. <laughs> Ooh, we'll have a celebration to celebrate. <laughs> hey, do you fancy out special for your supper tonight, Mort? Aye. What? Pickled onions and Cheshire cheese. And so wedding arrangements were put into full swing. The back room of the Axe and Cleaver was booked for the reception. My mother ordered six dozen Unsworth pork pies. She dispatched Pat and me to collect Uncle Staveley. He was my dad's eldest brother. He was to be best man. We drove over the moorlands to collect him from the old folks home where he lived. We hadn't gone far when Pat made me stop the car. We climbed over a stone stile into a field. A bay pit pony watched us. The field was scarred by ditches. There were mortar mixers and piles of bricks. There was a sign which read, Acker's Owns, Select Estate for Young Executives. Well, Carter, what do you think to it, love? This? <laughs> I think they reckon countryside building new houses. Well, people have got to have somewhere to live, Carter. 
I mean, there must be hundreds of young couples positively yearning to live on a select estate like this. But right, we should be looking for somewhere like this. Mm. You see, Carter, we haven't done a thing about getting a house for when we're married, have we? Mm. My mum says it's high time we sorted all the finances out. My mm. mum says we should be thinking in terms of whether we can afford a new house with lounge diner and integral waste disposal, or whether we should go into furnished rooms with no pets allowed. My mm. mum says we could always live with her. I mean, she's got a lovely spare bedroom, and she'd have no objection to you sharing the bath with her, provided you used your own flannel. Mm. You're not taking a word in, are you, Carter? Oh, You're just standing there looking gormless. I'm thinking. Why don't you think of us? Together in a hacker's home, with you smoking your bulldog pipe and me putting gumption down our low-level flush. You know what your trouble is, don't you? No. You have no sense of imagination. We picked Uncle Stavely up from the old folks' home. He had porridge stains on his chin. We passed by a reservoir, adrift with damp gulls, and Uncle Stavely said... I didn't meet Corporal Parkinson then. Pardon? Who? Corporal Parkinson. Bum. He's my uncle, is Corporal Parkinson. Is he? Bum. They tell me how a mort's getting married again. That's right, Uncle Stavely. Your mum wrote a letter telling me. Bum. What's our Edna got to say about it then, eh? Bum. She's dead, Uncle Stavely. That's why Uncle Mort's getting married again. Oh, dead, is she? Bum. Aye, that's right. That's why you came to a funeral. Do you remember? Remember? Pardon? We brought Uncle Stavely home. We had pickled onions and Cheshire cheese for supper. Then my mother gave Uncle Stavely his wedding suit to try on. It was the one my father had ripped the day Wakefield Trinity beat Featherstone Rovers. What's all this in aid of, Pardon? It's to make sure you look nice and decent for the wedding, Stavely. Oh, going to be a wedding, is there? I've not been to a wedding since our Mort got married to Edna. Will she be there, Pom? The day of the wedding dawned dull and drizzly. It usually does in our part of the world. The vicar asked Auntie Lil if she would take Uncle Mort as her lawfully wedded husband. She said, Yes, I will. They usually do in our part of the world. The reception at the Axe and Cleaver was much enjoyed by one and all. The boiled ham was a little on the fatty side and the individual trifles weren't up to much, but the tea was wet and warm and the Unsworth pork pies gave no offence, provided you drowned them in sauce and onion chutney. After the honeymooners had departed for Douglas, Isle of Man, I went outside. I found an owlet at the bottom of a tree. I took it home and put it in a box in the garage. I called it Bentley. It seemed to like me. Shortly after the honeymooners returned from Douglas, Isle of Man, my mother said, I can't help worrying over your stable, Les. What's up with him? I keep thinking of him in that old folks' home. I'm sure they're very kind to him, but they won't maintain him proper like his own would. Mm. I'm going to invite him to come and live with us. What do you say to that, Les? Bloody hell. And I think we'd best invite his friend to stay and all. What do you say to that, Mart? Ditto. A letter was dispatched to the old folks' home. The matron replied, stating that the restoration to the family bosom of Uncle Stavely plus Oppo, Corporal Parkinson, would afford her nothing but pleasure. But what about my pleasure, Mort? Pardon? When my baby comes, I just won't be able to do with an old man around the house, coughing and not wiping his nose. Mm, he's always got a dewdrop on the end of his beak, Stavely. Very congenital a dewdrops in his family. And what about this Corporal Parkinson? Who's he when he's at home? The answer to that was soon provided when me and my mother went to the station to collect the two old men. There's your Uncle Stavely, Carter. Stavely! Stavely! Honest to God, Carter, just look at the state of his muffler. Hey up then, Uncle Stavely. Uh, where's Corporal Parkinson? In the guard's van. Pardon? What's he doing in guard's van? It's to keep his chemical lavatory company. Pardon? He's a martyr to field hygiene, is Corporal Parkinson. Pardon? Come on, Carter, let's go and collect him. We went to the guard's van and waited. 
They unloaded three boxes of chickens, two rolls of lino, one greyhound with muzzle, nine bundles of exchange and mart, and finally, a wicker bath chair. Sitting in it was a small, emaciated figure. It was swathed in army blankets. Out of its right ear stuck a black Bakelite hearing aid. Round its neck was tied a label which read, Fragile, to be called for. Corporal Parkinson retired. This way, up. How do you do, Corporal Parkinson? Did you have a pleasant journey, love? <laughs> He says it was a very good journey, apart from the greyhound, which spent all the time flecking itself. <laughs> Pardon? I wheeled the chair to the car and lifted Corporal Parkinson out. Oh, dear, Carter. Oh, dear, oh, dear. What's up? Well, look at him. He's got no legs. You never told me he was infirm, Stavely. He isn't. He's just got a spot of tummy trouble. Pardon? My mother put the two old men in the attic. We didn't see much of them. One day, Uncle Mort saw Uncle Stavely standing at the window, semaphoring. With no John, too. Fancy semaphoring, bollock naked at his age. No wonder Moscow's got a bad name. Meanwhile, the owlets grew in my garage and the baby grew in Auntie Lil's womb. One evening, me and Pat went to a dance with my mate, Derek Warrender, and his bird, Jesse Lewis. I danced with Jesse for a bit. She pressed herself into me. Her hair brushed my cheeks. Her hand caressed the nape of my neck. Her breath was sweet. I got her hard on. How's your owl, Carter? Oh, going champion, thank you. Is it a tawny owl? I suppose it is. Aye. There used to be barn owls where I lived. Gorgeous. We used to see them hunting among the bats at dusk. They were all white and soft and silent. Beautiful creatures, aren't they, Carter? Aye. I suppose your owl eats a lot, does he? Oh, aye. <laughs> when it comes to grub, owls are right gannets. <laughs> I'd like to come round and see him sometime. Aye, well, um... I suppose it wouldn't be all that. Oh dear, the music stopped. I'd best be getting back to my fiancé. That's right, Carter, of course you must. Duty always calls for you, my love. At midnight, I left with Pat. We drove through a land of low hills and coppices. There were struggling edges and rusting pit heads. We saw a barn owl hunting. When we got to her house, I took her into the front parlour. Oh, look, Carter, my mother's left sandwiches. Do you like brawn, or would you prefer the coward with tomato sauce? I switched off the light and put my hand down the front of her frock. She's very attractive, isn't she, Carter? Oh. Jessie Lewis. Hmm. I like to see you dancing with other girls, Carter. Hmm. I think it makes a fella appreciate his own girl more, don't you, Carter? Hmm. Carter? What? I think your cufflinks caught in the top of my vest. Time passed slowly. It usually does in our part of the world. There was an outbreak of summer flu. There was an outbreak of wireworms on the allotments. Funny things, wireworms. There was a sudden storm. Sight screens at cricket grounds were blown over. Funny things, sight screens. At the weekend, I went on the works outing. I sat next to Linda Preston on coach. We shared a bag of humbugs. Funny things on bugs, aren't they, Carter? We went to New Brighton. It was grand. Linda Preston and me got on ferry to Liverpool. It was grand. I love a boat trip, me. So do I. We had a cup of tea at a stall on the pier head. Pigeons strutted. How's the love life, kid? What do you mean? Is our Pat still keeping you short? Pardon? Tell me something, kid. What? Have you ever had it? Ah, uh, well, um... <laughs> you haven't, have you? I can see it in your face. Ah, well. Hmm. Oh, you poor devil, Carter. You poor old bugger. The coach left New Brighton at midnight. We arrived home at the bus station at two. It was raining. 
I took Linda Preston home by taxi. Are you coming in then, Carter? Oh, no, Tar. I've got to get home to see to me owl. Your owl? Oh, you wet, you chump. She dragged me inside. She shoved me into the front parlour. She locked the door. You hadn't, have you, kid? Eh? You've never had it. <clears throat> no, not in so many words. She looked at me for a moment. Then she took her clothes off. Oh, she'd a smashing pair of watchets on her. I couldn't take my eyes off them. They weren't like Pat's. They were bigger. Well then, Carter. She moved towards me. She stuck the tip of her tongue between her teeth. She ran her hands down the front of her thighs. And next thing I knew, she dragged me on the rug beside her and said... Right then, Carter. Here's your chance to break your duck. When I got home, there was a note for me on the hat stand. It read, Jesse Lewis called to see your owl. Yours faithfully, your father. The following evening, I met Pat outside Town Hall. Right then, Carter, that's it. It's all over. What? You're not fit to be engaged, you. Manking around with another woman when you're supposed to be promised to me. If, if you're talking about the outing, nothing happens. I'm not talking about the outing. I'm talking about Jessie Lewis. What? I saw her this morning. She said she'd been round to see your owl. Oh, yeah, I know, but... Fancy not telling your fiancé you've got an owl. How can there be ever any basis of trust between us when you live a secret life with an owl? I know, but... It's no a... use arguing, Carter. I've talked it over with Mother and we've decided it's no use carrying on no longer. You can have your ring back and we'll finish here and now. She shoved the ring into the breast pocket of me jacket. It clanked against me ballpoint pens. Then she turned and click-clacked away towards the memorial gardens. I went into the Griffin for a pint. I met me Uncle Mort. I told him the engagement was off. Is it? Uh, oh. I say Freddie Truman got six wickets yesterday. Did he? Ah. Uh. That night I went to the Dog and Partridge with me dad, Uncle Mort and Uncle Staveley. We had two hands of dominoes and three pints of Outhwaite's best bitter. Then Uncle Staveley said... Your lil's putting thievil fluence on me, Mort. Pardon? You what? She's putting thievil fluences on me. They come from her unborn child. He's pots for rags. He's going off his bloody bean pot. Oh, I can feel it at night. It comes from her womb. Pardon? And then it creeps up through coverlets, works its way up light fittings, seeps through floorboards and attacks me as a lie bed. Pum. Uncle Mort looked at him silently. Then he took off his cap and polished his paint. Well, Lish, what do you think? Rum, isn't it? I see Freddie Truman got another six wickets. That night, me owlet took its first flight from the garage. Go wick, go wick, go wick. He went as he floated on soft wings past Auntie Lil's bedroom. Mort! Mort! Yes, Lil, what's to do? Oh, it's starting, Mort. The evil fluence is starting. Can't you feel it? Can't you hear it dripping from the ceiling and seeping through the coverlet? No, Lil, no. Likely it's something you've eaten. I'll give you a thumb bump back if you like. Oh, no, Mort, don't touch me. You'll catch it yourself and then you'll be done for. <laughs> oh, hey, up now. Don't start the old waterworks, love. If my Bob were here, he wouldn't stand for it. He'd have put his foot down long ago. Maybe, Lil, maybe. You're all just trying to destroy our child. As none of you wants it. You're all jealous because me and my Bob are having a baby at our age. What do you mean, you and your Bob having a baby? And I shall always think of it as my Bob's child. You were just the agency that united me with my Bob on the other side. Bloody hell, Lil, that's the first time I've ever been called an agency. July gave way to August and the weather broke. It usually did in our part of the world. One evening I was on my way to play a game of snooker with Sid Skellorn when I bumped into Jesse Lewis. Hello, Carter. I'm just going swimming at Encar Edge. Would you like to come? I haven't got a cosy. You can have one there. Come on, where's your car? We drove over the moors to Encar Edge. Kestrels hovered. Jesse Lewis swam for half an hour. I only had five minutes. The chlorine got up my nose. 
We had fish and chips from the shop next door to the sub post office. Then we went to the Pack Horse Inn for a drink. Is that a jackdaw on the stable roof, Carter? Aye. Beautiful, isn't it? Gorgeous. On the way home, she sang softly to herself. She wore a navy blue sweater with no sleeves. Her hair was swept back. It was blonde hair, ash grey at the tips. She turned to me and smiled. Did you see Pat in the pub, Carter? What? She was sitting in the private bar. She was with some chap in a uniform. Oh. She saw us, but she didn't let on. Oh, well. Right then, here we are. You can drop me off now. Oh, no, I'll run you home. No, Carter. No, thank you. Aye, well... Uh, can I... Uh... Can you see me again? Aye, that's right. We'll see, Carter. We'll see. We had pickled onions and Cheshire cheese for supper that evening. Auntie Lil dunked a cream cracker in a cocoa. Then she turned to the company and said... I don't think it's right and proper for our mark to be sharing the same bed as me. Why the hell not? Well, with me and my Bob about to have a baby, I think Mark's presence in my bed is improper. He's done his stuff and we're very grateful. But I think he should now have the good grace and common decency to relinquish his position in the conjugal bed. Mm, that's all very well, Lil, but it's a question of accommodation, you see. I could put him in the attic with Staveley and Corporal Parkinson, but it might disturb the mice, mightn't it? There's no need to go to no trouble, Annie. In my possessions, I have a portable camp bed. Mort can sleep on it at the foot of my bed. Mm. Well, if anyone tries the handle during the night, I'll bark me bloody head off. On Thursday, the sun came out. Blackbirds sang. Jessie Lewis rang me at work and asked me to go swimming with her. Mm, I did. We dived for pennies. Once, we surfaced together and Jessie kissed me full on the lips. Long and slow. That was rather nice, wasn't it, Carter? Aye. We must do it again sometime. Aye. You're doing out next Monday. Sorry, Carter. When I got home, my mother greeted me with a scowl in the back parlour. Pat's been round to see you, young man. Oh, I... I took a helping of pickled onions and Cheshire cheese. Well, don't you want to know what she wanted? Ah, I suppose so. She wanted to see you. What for? I should have thought that were obvious. Good heavens above, Carter, I just don't understand you. You've got a lovely lass there who's pining her heart away for you. She'd make you a smashing wife. She's got lovely taste in soft furnishings. But no, you just don't want to know. You just won't make the effort. You was the same with that Meccano set we bought you for your sixth birthday. Stuck it was. Unused in the cockloft for nine solid years. Oh, give over, Annie. Leave that alone. I will not leave him alone. I badgered and badgered and badgered him till he made that model of a windmill from his Meccano. Well... I intend to badger and badger and badger him until he makes it up with Pat. That's why I've invited her and her mother to tea next Sunday. Oh, well. Ye gods. Do you think we could have arsenic sauce with our boiled ham? Pat and her mother came round to tea. We had pick a lily with a boiled ham. When the meal was over, my mother said... Now then, you two young ones, <laughs> why don't you repair to the front parlour? I'm sure you must have oodles and oodles to talk about. We went into the front parlour. My mother had put roses in a jar on the mantelpiece and polished the goldfish bowl special. Pat sat on the sofa. I sat on the Lloyd Loom rocker. The clock ticked. Well then, Carter. Hmm? How's Jessie Lewis? Pardon? You know she saw me in the pack horse the other night, don't you? Mm. Well, that fella I was with in uniform wasn't a boyfriend or old like that, Carter. He was me cousin Neville. You remember, he's the one that got a stone in his shoe in the Goit Valley. Well, he's just qualified as a radio officer with Marconi. He sailed for Djibouti yesterday. Mm. I thought you'd like to know. Oh, aye. They say it can be quite nice in Djibouti. Carter. Yeah? Have you still got me ring? Aye. Where is it, love? Uh, that's in that jam jar with green shield stamps. 
Will you do something for me? Will you put it on my finger just to see if it still fits? All right. There you are. Oh, Carter, it does. It still fits perfect. Do you like it on my finger, like this? Hmm. Carter. Yeah? Shall I keep it there for ever and ever and ever till death us do part and silver threads appear among the gold? If you like. Oh, Carter, does that mean we're engaged again? Oh, I, I suppose it must do. Oh, Carter, I do love you. You're so romantic, you're so positive. Oh, oh, could you just peel that green shield stamp off the front? I think it spoils the effect of the cluster, don't you? My mother was chuffed to bollocks when she heard the news. Oh, Carter, oh, Pat, I'm, I'm right glad. I'm right happy. <laughs> I'm over the moon. <laughs> and with that, she conked out and keeled over on the floor. Women... They've always got to be bloody showing off. But my mother wasn't showing off. When we called the doctor, he said she was in poor shape. He said what with caring for Auntie Lil, running up and downstairs to Uncle Stavely and Corporal Parkinson, fixing a new chain guard on Uncle Mort's bike, and renewing the guttering at the back of the house, she was suffering from complete mental and physical exhaustion. I'm not surprised. I told her she were asking for trouble putting up that scaffolding all on her jack. The doctor confined her to bed. He said she had to stay there for six weeks. Six weeks? Well, who's going to do cooking? Ah, oh, well, I suppose I'd better have a bash. Uh, do you know if fish fingers are in season at the moment? The day after my mother fell ill, Auntie Lil took to her bed. She said she would remain there until the child was born. Two days later, Corporal Parkinson fell ill. Ye gods, you wouldn't think there was enough of him left to be ill, would you? True, Mort. Very true. Hey, which way up do you open this tin of baked beans? Next morning, the doctor visited the house and told me father that his problems were over. Your problems are over, Mr Brandon. Ta. I'm arranging for a nurse to come round this afternoon and she'll be here for as long as you require. A nurse, eh? By God, that sounds favourite. Now, what about accommodation? Accommodation? She'll have to live in, you know. Oh, she can have my room. I'll sleep downstairs on sofa. Oh, splendid. All hands to the pump, eh? You're very lucky getting this nurse, you know. Oh, yes, she's only young, but she's one of the most capable nurses in the district, is Nurse Lewis. Lewis? That's right. Uh, Jessie Lewis, I believe. She tells me she knows you vaguely. Vaguely? Aye, the very word. Jessie Lewis. Oh, well, lad, that's bloody torn it now. At half past two, Jessie Lewis arrived at our house. She was in uniform. Her eyelashes were long and curved. Her skin was smooth. Hello, Carter. You never told me you was a nurse. You never asked. Now then, after I've seen to the invalids, you can run me back to my flat. I have a few things to pick up. I drove her to her flat. She lived in a bed sitter in a sandstone mansion. There was a monkey puzzle tree in the front garden. From a window, I could see a rumpled cricket pitch and two Afghan hounds chasing a red rubber ball. Carter? Yes? Come here. I turned round. She was lying on her bed. Her frock was unbuttoned. Don't be shy, Carter. Don't be bashful. She'd a smashing pair of watsits on her. I couldn't keep my eyes off them. They weren't like Pat's. They were... bigger. Come on, Carter. Lie down beside me. I took my jacket off and lay down beside her. She kissed me. I kissed her. Then she pulled my pants off. Swiftly, savagely. Carter. Carter. Please, please, Carter. Oh. What's wrong? Oh, bother. That always happens when I get too excited. It usually does in our part of oh, the world. Oh, Carter. Oh, Carter. Carter Brandon, what a man. In the evening, I met Pat at the Piccolo coffee bar. The waiters wore gondoliers jumpers and the Danish pastries were limp. I told Pat about Jessie Lewis coming to live in our house. I see. Now, don't look at me like that. It wasn't my fault. If it had been left to me, I'd have told her to sling a rook. I'd have been right adamant and told well, her to... I don't mind, Carter. What? I'm delighted. What? It'll cement the bands of binding trust between us, won't it, darling? What? Well, you love me so much, you'll never be the slightest bit tempted by her, will you? 
And I trust you so much, I know you'll always be constant and true and remember to keep the toilet door locked. Am I right, Carter? Hmm. Now then, love, I've been thinking. It's high time we set a date for the wedding. Now, what are your thoughts regarding the new? We can have the ceremony in St Winifred's the Blessed Virgin, or we could plump for St Cuthbert's, if you don't mind the vicar's big ears. I said I had nothing against big ears, and so the decision was made. Back home, Jessie Lewis settled in well. She moved softly around the house. It was good to get up of a morning and know she'd be there. Uncle Mort was most attentive to her every whim. I've brought your bottle of glucose stout, Jessie. I wish I could take the top off with my teeth for you. My father was politeness itself towards her. Excuse me, Jessie. I, I don't want to impose, but uh, do you think you could put a new plug on the hoover for me? Uncle Staveley made brief forays from the attic and padded round after her. Corporal Parkinson says you brought a ray of sunshine into our lives, Jessie, and I agree. Pardon? Even my mother and Auntie Lil could find nothing to complain about. She's so kind. She's so thoughtful. She's so comforting. My Bob's right delighted with her performance. One evening I stood next to her in the back garden. My owl sat on top of the garage roof and hooted. Are you happy with your lot, Carter? Pardon? Happy, Carter. You know what it means, don't you? Oh, I. I know what it means, all right. Oh, my God, Carter. That'll make your lovely wife. You look a treat together. You smoking your bulldog pipe in your lounge diner and pat dust in the seat on your low-level flush. Mm. <laughs> Why don't you take me out, Carter? Because I'm engaged to Pat. Well, don't let that put you off. Tell you what, Carter, we'll go back to my flat sometime and try again, eh? Ah, uh, well, hmm. Aye, well, hmm. Beautiful, Carter. Perfect. Mm. Hey, oh. Not here. I'm supposed to be... You're supposed to be with your Aunt Lil right now. She wants you urgently. See you, Carter. She walked away. She left the slow, soft sense of her body behind her. I went upstairs to Auntie Lil's bedroom. She lay up in bed, propped up by two bolsters and the cushion from the dog's basket. Hello, Carter. Hello, Auntie Lil. Come and sit alongside me on the bed, Carter. Have something I want to tell you. Right, Auntie Lil. What I'm about to say to you must go no farther than these four walls. Do you understand, Carter? Yes. Good. Well, I want you to make me a promise. Hmm? I want you to promise me that if anything should happen to me, you'll take sole responsibility for the upbringing of my baby. Oh, no. Come on, Auntie Lil, you're not to say things like that. Do you promise me that faithfully, Carter? Well, I mean, I'm Do not... you, Carter? Do you? I... Yes. Yes, I, I promise, Auntie Lil. Oh, you're a good lad, Carter. Not like the rest of them. I don't trust no one here, you see, Carter. All them evil fluences... They're just trying to kill me and my unborn child. They're just envious. They're all full of evil. She lay back on the bed. She closed her eyes. A slow smile came to her lips. Evil. 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 Only one thing marred the birth of Auntie Lil's baby three weeks later. Er, uh, that was the death of Auntie Lil. By God. I'm a right bloody Jonah with wives, me. Poor Lil. Poor soul. We'll get the outside caterers for a funeral party, shall we? They called the baby Daniel, in memory of Auntie Lil's old bull terrier. The baby lay in an oxygen tent in the hospital. He were right tiny. We rang the hospital every morning and visited him every evening. It's playing havoc with my snooker practice, is this? I'll never get into team if he doesn't grow any bigger. Corporal Parkinson's decline was steady. Day by day, the old soldier's progress was outlined by his friend and confidante. The end's not far off now, Pum. 
Jess is up there now, oiling his hearing aid. Poor old soldier, he's... My oppo is Corporal Parkinson. He's going to die. Pardon? We sat in the front parlour one evening. A blue bottle buzzed. It drowned the noise of next door's Hoover. Uncle Mort looked up from the plimsolls he was blankoing and said, I can't help worrying about Thingy. Thingy? Ah, what's his name? Thingy? What's his name? His name's Daniel. Daniel! That's the name of your baby, Mort. If you can't remember it, write it down on a piece of paper and stick it on your diary. Any road, what are you worried about? Well, what am I going to do with it when it comes out of hospital? Well, you've got Jesse, you daft pillock. Mm, true, that's true. But the thing is, I don't fancy the idea of a stranger tampering with him like that. Tampering? How do you mean? You know, a, a single woman taking his gear off and... Fiddling round with his little doodah when she gives him a bath. Eh, you do talk empty, Mort. She's trained for that sort of work. They show them pictures of things like that. In colour, too. Oh, maybe, but what about Thingy? They've not given him no training for it, have they? Next morning I got up early. I shaved myself carefully, I put on my best suit, and I said to my mother... right up. I'll drive you over to collect Daniel. There's no need to trouble yourself. Oh, it's no trouble. I'm taking day off work. I don't know why you're taking such an interest in babies, Carter. You're not sickening for summit, are you? I prepared the car for the trip. I put three rugs on the back seat. I filled up two hot water bottles. My mother, Uncle Mort and Jessie Lewis drove with me to the hospital. Oh, by God, Carter, I'm nervous. Hmm. I felt just like this when I was waiting for Johnny Carey to lead the lads out at Wembley in 48. Twenty minutes later, my mother and Jessie Lewis reappeared. Jessie Lewis carried Daniel in her arms. As soon as we got home, she fed him. We all gathered round to watch. Bless him. Look at his little hands grasping the titty bottle. They can be almost human at times, can babies. Bit of all right, that titty bottle, eh, Daniel? Hey, up, Jessie. Should he be dribbling like that? Oh, Carter, do give over, will you? Bless him. He's loved, you know. You love, don't you, Daniel? <laughs> what do you think to him then, Mart? All right. He's a rum-looking little bugger, though, isn't he? Oh. Thingy. Thingy? How many more times do I have to tell you his name's Daniel? And what's rum about him, any road? His head. What's wrong with his head? There's no wrong with it in a medical sense. It's just that it's shaped like a potato. It is not. He's got a smashing little head on him. You'd go a long way to find a better head on a baby than that. Oh, maybe, but I'll bet you straight ten bob my cat wouldn't fit on it. Mort, if you can't make any more sensible comments than that, kindly leave the room and clear the debts for us. All right, then. And I'll tell you something else about him, too. What? He's just farted. Mort! Are you coming for a pint, Carter? We went to the Axe and Cleaver and drank our pints slowly. At times like this, Carter, a man is utterly helpless. Mm. The women take charge and we might just as well sit in the cupboard under the stairs and scratch ourselves. Mm. It was the same when you was born. Your dad and me was at a football match. They put this message out over the public address and they stopped the bloody match for it. Did they? Of course they did. Go to the maternity home on account of impending Bambino, they said. In front of a 50,000 gate, too. No. We didn't know where to put ourselves. Well, you wouldn't. Of course we wouldn't. And then, when we get to the hospital, your mother plays merry yell up about us not bringing no flowers. <laughs> I mean, how the hell can you get flowers at a football match? I mean, that's women all over. They don't think of things like that. Mm. What it is, they don't want us to steal their thunder. You show an interest by remarking on the resemblance of its dome to a potato and they come down on you like a ton of bricks. Mm. Next thing, they'll be wanting to circumcise the poor little bugger. They always do. They think they're getting their own back on us. That evening, Pat came round to see the baby. We went upstairs. We stood at the foot of the cot and looked down on Daniel. Can you imagine what it'll be like when you and me have our own baby, Carter? Hmm. He done half twitch in his sleep. Should he be twitching like that? I think we should wait a bit, though, before having babies. Don't you, Carter? I think we should take precautions, don't you? Hmm. Should he be sucking the sheet like that? I've been reading one of them little books, Carter. It tells you how to take precautions. 
I never knew you could buy precautions in a barber's shop, did you, Carter? Hmm. He's going red in the face. Should he be going red in the face like that? No, mind out of the way, Carter. Hello, Daniel. Goochie, goochie, goo. He's a good little boy, Dan. Who's a little Bobby Dad in the den? Goochie, goochie, goo. Hey, I hope he started to smile. <laughs> he must like you. Not as much as I like you, Carter. I love you. Do you love me? Hmm. I just can't wait for our honeymoon night, Carter. I'll let you see me in the nude if you promise not to look till I'm decent. We had pickled onions and Cheshire cheese for supper, and then I went to bed. But shortly after midnight, I heard Daniel crying. He started to scream louder and louder and louder. Hold on, Daniel. Hold on, old son. I'll be wee in a jiffy. I climbed out of bed. I went into the bedroom. Jessie Lewis lay asleep in bed. She had one bare arm resting lightly on top of the eiderdown. Jessie. Jessie. Jessie, the baby's crying. For God's sake, Jessie, wake up. The baby's screaming its bloody head off. Wake up. What's the matter? Carter, what the hell are you doing here? It's Daniel. He's bawling his head off. For heaven's sake, Carter, clear off. Are you mad? What do you think your parents would say if they caught you in here? I know, but it's Daniel, Jesse. He's... he's... Hey, up. <laughs> he stopped crying. I couldn't take my eyes off her. She was sitting upright in bed. I could see her breasts rising and falling. I could see the dark of her nipples. They weren't like Pat's. They was bigger. Jessie. No, Carter, no, not here. Oh, Jessie. Oh, Jessie, please. She pulled back the bedclothes. She pulled off her nightgown. I lay alongside her. She pulled off my pyjamas. I buried my head in her breasts. Oh, Carter. Oh, Carter. Very slowly, she guided me into her. Carter. Carter. This time it were all right. This time it were champion. This time it were... And then the door opened. Will? Are you all right, Will? Um... Oh, Will. Will, what are you crying for, Will? Keep still, Carter. Don't move. Are you all right, Will? Um... Yes, thank you, Stavely. I'm right as rain. Um... Is that a, a cot you've got there, Lil Pop? That's right, Stavely. My baby's in there. He's called Daniel. Oh, that must be what I heard crying then, Pop. Very slowly, he edged towards the bed. Very slowly, Jessie wrapped the sheet about her. Very slowly, she climbed out of bed and took Uncle Stavely by the shoulders. Good night, Stavely. Pop? Good night. Darling Stavely. <laughs> she led him to the door. She took him in her arms. The sheet dropped to the floor. She kissed him long and hard on the lips. Darling Stavely. <sighs> darling, darling Stavely. You kissed me, Lil, didn't you, eh, Pom? That's right, Stavely. Stavely. <laughs> My God. By hell. <laughs> Wait till more tears of this. <laughs> Bum. After that, I couldn't keep away from Daniel. I watched Jessie bathing him. I watched her feeding him. I took him walks in his pram. I sat in the bedroom listening to him breathing in the darkness. <laughs> Sometimes I felt a chuff. Sometimes I wanted to leave him alone, but I couldn't. I, I don't know what it was, but something stopped me leaving him alone. A week later, something rather rum happened. Daniel spoke to me. Ah, it happened like this. It was the first day of December. There was ice on the roads. I sat with me arm round Pat in her front parlour. Her stockings rasped, her earrings jangled, and she sighed. <sighs> Do you know where I've been today, Carter? No. I've been with my mother to have a look at the new estate of young executive residences at Plainmore Bank. Oh. They're exactly us, Carter. What are? The residences. Oh. That's the term young executives use for houses. Well, 
These houses are bungalows. Danish ranch house style with lounge diner, low-level flush and integral waste disposal. Mm. So I put a deposit down there and then. Carter! Uh, yeah? Carter, you are about to become an owner-occupier. What do you think to that, love? Oh, shit out. When I got home, I went straight up to Daniel's bedroom. He wanted to sleep. He was awake. He stared at me with his big blue eyes. Hello, Daniel. All right, are you? A smile came to his face. And then it happened. I said to him, I'm going to buy a house, Daniel. And he said... She thought. I didn't tell no one what had happened. Next morning, I took Daniel out in his pram. I stopped on the towpath of the cut at the back of the snuff warehouse and said... Did you, um... Did you talk to me last night, Daniel? That's right. Oh. Huh. Rum, ain't it? That's right. I had a fag, then I carried on the walk. We'd just levelled with the Dubbin repository when Daniel said... Are you looking forward to getting married, Carter? What do you think, Daniel? I'd say you hadn't thought about it too much, Carter. I've thought a few things about it, Daniel. Mostly about what it'll be like getting me underway with Pat. Anything else? Well, to be perfectly honest with you, Daniel, no. And what do you think about Pat? Oh, I don't know, really. I can't make her out. Oh, she gives me a pain up the spout most of the time, but I can't help liking her when it comes to push. I see. And what about Jessie Lewis? What do you think to her? Jessie Lewis? Ah, well... Hmm. Do you know what, Carter? What, Daniel? I think you're a prize bloody pillock. Shortly after that, Uncle Stavely fell mortally ill. We were in the pub playing a damp hand of fives and threes when he said... The evil fluences have started again. Pardon? Evil fluences? That's right. They are emanating from little... Pardon? How can they emanate from her, you daft old chuff? She's hmm? dead. Snuffed it. Lil's no longer with us. I beg to differ. Pardon? Last week, she seduced me. You what? Pardon? She seduced me. She dragged me into bed and kissed me on the chest. I wasn't wearing no clothes. Hey, Pardon? I caught my nose on the end of her tits. Um, I told you, I told you, didn't I? He's pots for rags. Medically speaking, he's the classic case of a punter what is going off his beanpole. Three hours later, Uncle Stavely was at death's door. I were in bed and I heard this crash from the attic. I dashed upstairs. Uncle Stavely was stretched out on the floor. He was blue in the face. He was clutching something in his right hand. I bent down to have a look. It was the corpse of an owl. It was Bentley. His neck had been wrung. Aye, it was twisted right round. When the doctor came, he examined Uncle Stavely and his oppo, Corporal Parkinson. I'm afraid this is the end. Oh, dear, what a pity. Is there no hope? None at all, Mrs Brandon. Oh, dear. I went into the bedroom and I said to Daniel, Poor old devils. Mm. They've been all over the world, you know, them two. They've been to places you and me would give our iron teeth to see. And now they're going to snuff it in an attic with dry rot and creaking floorboards. Mm. Funny thing is, Daniel, that when they tell me about all the eye jinks and adventures they got up to when they was younger, I always think of them as looking then as what they do now. Mm. Uh, take Uncle Stavely. There was one night he told me all about the adventures he'd had at sea. He went to a brothel once in South America. It was like a bloody great palace. There were crystal chandeliers and red velvet sofas and a balcony that went right round the hall. And all the women were stood there on pedestals. Oh, what a choice, Daniel. There were negresses and Jewesses and blondes and dark-haired gypsy bints with rampant knockers. And they was all dressed immaculate in silks and satins. But the funny thing was, they'd all got their bosoms with nothing on. 
Bloody hell. Hey, up, Carter. Are you sure you should be telling me all this? I'm only a baby, you know. Shh, Daniel. Shh, could you, could you, could you? Get over. Get on with the bloody story, will you? Oh. Ah, oh, right, oh. Well, <clears throat> Uncle Stavely has to make his choice. But it didn't take him long. He chose this little chinky piece with long, dark hair falling all down her back. Oh, what a pearler. What a little Brahma. She took Uncle Stavely by the hand. She led him into this room what had a ginormous bed. And she gave him a push to this little chinky piece and he fell slowly backwards on the bed. He looked up at her and smiled. She smiled too. She didn't do out. She just stood at the foot of the bed, smiling at him. That's a bit rum, isn't it, Carter? Hmm. And then suddenly, Daniel, she pulls at a cord wrapped round her waist, and next minute, all her clothes fall off, and she stood there, bollock naked. Bloody hell! But the thing he couldn't take his eyes off was this bloody great jewel she'd got in her navel. It was a red ruby. It lit up the whole room. It was like a, a fire burning deep inside her. Truth. And then, very slowly, she kneels on the bed beside him and she takes off all his clothes. But he's not looking at Nout by this bloody great red ruby. It mesmerised him. It put him in a trance. Then suddenly she takes the ruby out of her navel. She starts to rub it over his body. And then he notices all these... Mirrors round the room, does me Uncle Stavely. They're tinted a sort of rose colour. But the funny thing is that each mirror reflects a different picture of him. In one, he's big and bold. In another, he's weak. In another, he's a big, handsome bastard. In another, he's all skinny and ugly. You see, Daniel, each mirror reflects him at a different age in his life. But he feels like each one of them reflections, they're all inside him. But each one is separate, harmonious, at ease. And as he's telling me all these things, Daniel, I didn't picture him as the young man he was. I pictured him as he is now. I saw him lying on that ginormous bed with a chinky piece rubbing his body with a ruby and him saying pardon every five seconds. I could see him old and white-haired with a hollow chest and thick purple veins twined round his legs. I could see his leathery belly. I could see the segs on the soles of his feet. I could see that bloody great dewdrop he's always got on the end of his conch. Rum, ain't it, Daniel? That's life, Carter. That's life, me old wingsy bash. Hmm... And do you know what happens to the rich red ruby jewel of your prime? No. It turns into an icy dewdrop on the end of your conch. The year limped along to its end. Uncle Stavely and Corporal Parkinson slowly faded away. Day by day they grew weaker. One night I went to the pub with me dad and Uncle Mort. You know, Liz, I don't think life's worth living no more. Why not? Well, look at it through my eyes, Liz. I've got a baby, and I'm not allowed to go near it. Every time I set foot in its bedroom, I'm shooed out as though I'm going to give it the bloody plague or something. I thought you said you hadn't got no interest in babies. I haven't. Well, then. All I want to do is go up and give it a dig in its ribs and say, I'll do. I mean, after all, Les, I've got responsibilities to it. I'm its bloody father when all's said and done. I mean... It might go all antisocial if its father doesn't go up to it from time to time and say, I'll do. We walked home slowly. There was a clear sky. The stars shone brightly. Uncle Mort stopped and looked up at them, glistening in the sharp, frosty air. Do you believe in heaven, Les? Hey, I'm not quite sure. Why? Well, I was just wondering if I'll go up there when I stuff it. Oh, don't mind that on about that, Mort. You're bound to end up somewhere when you snuff it. Mm. That's just what's bothering me. Christmas week came in with slow fogs and long, sluggish nights. I had a row with Pat. It was over the firm's Christmas dance and social. 
She wouldn't go. But she had a suggestion as regards me. You can go with Jesse Lewis. What? It'll be a reward for all the long, hard, selfless hours she's put in looking after you and your family. And Carter. Yes? You know I can trust you, don't you? On the evening of the social, I went into the bedroom and looked down at Daniel. He winked at me and smiled. Hey, up, Bugalooks. All set for the social, are you? Aye. It's a big chance tonight, eh? Big chance? Jesse Lewis. Oh, hold on, Daniel. This evening's just purely Keep a little... Keep over. Pull the other one. Here's your big chance tonight, kid. Here's your way out from lounge diners and low-level flushes and bulldog pipes and chunky cardigans. Here's your way out from a bird who gives you pain up the spout. For God's sake, man, she's laid it right in your lap. Take it while it's going. You'll never get the opportunity again. Jessie is yours for the taking tonight, your wingsy bash. Take it. I'm your son. You'll have your freedom. I will. Uh, hmm. Never mind I will. Hmm? Do something positive. The dance and social was held in the Azalea Ballroom. Tickets were 25 shillings each, including running Buffett. Music was provided by the music of Victor Sylvester, Oscar Grasso leading. Shall we dance, Carter? Aye, right oh. She pressed herself into me. Our cheeks touched. Her breasts and her thighs rubbed against me. The French choke rose round our ankles. Here you go, lad. It's all set up for you, son. Grab it, man. Grab it. I looked up at the balcony and saw Linda Preston staring down at us. She cocked her head to one side and raised her eyebrows. Happy, Carter? You're happy, lad. You're singing. You're soaring. We held hands when the music stopped. We sat in a quiet corner and she rested her head on my shoulder. I ran my hand up her arms. They were bare. I touched the tip of her nose with my tongue. I ran my fingers softly over the nape of her neck. And then... And then I was called to the manager's office to answer the phone. Is that you, Carter? Uh, yes. I just thought I'd ring to ask if you was enjoying yourself. Oh. Are you? What? Enjoying yourself. Oh, yes. <clears throat> Tara. Carter. What? You know I can trust you, love, don't you? Oh, I. Tara. <coughs> On my way back, I bumped into Sid Skellon. He was sucking his bottom dentures. Women. They're all the same, Carter. They're all a big illusion. They look all right now when they're all dolled up and showing off the tits. But picture them in the true colours. Think of them in the real pomp and prime. Here in curlers and sat on poor early doors. See you, Sid. Hey up, though, Carter. That one you're with tonight's a bit of all right, eh? What? <laughs> Bloody hell. Gives you a fair share of leg over, does it? Shows you plenty of... Bloody hell, it is, is the wife. Uh, see you, Carter. See you, lad. Uh, come in, dear. Come in. Jessie Lewis danced even closer to me. I rubbed my chin lightly in her ash blonde hair. Is Pat getting worried then, Carter? Pardon? Has she got cause to be worried, Carter? Pardon? Of course she has, lad. Tell her. Tell her now. This is your chance, mate. Deep.
Jesse, <clears throat> I was thinking. Well. Well? Well, I. Help, Tiger! You? you weren't on the phone in the fire. Oh, shit, Carter. Hello. Hello, Carter. Oh. I was just ringing to... Yes, I'm enjoying myself. Yes, Jessie's enjoying herself. Yes, I know you can trust me. Ta-ra, and good night. Right then, Daniel. This is it. This is where I make the big break. Good for you, lad. Good thinking. A new life, Daniel. A bird with blonde hair and green eyes. A bird with vision. A bird with imagination. A bird to fly to the heavens with. Aye, and it's got a tidy old pair of knockers on it, too. I walked purposefully to Jessie Lewis. She looked up at me and smiled. My word, Carter, you do look purposeful. Ah, uh -huh. I am. My word, Carter, my word. Right then, Jessie. What I'm going to Before say is... Before you say it, Carter, the answer's no. What? No, Carter. No, my love. It wouldn't work. It bloody would. Tell her, Carter, tell her. You're a stayer, Carter. A sticker. You're a plodder. You are sensational, my love. Mm. I'm leaving tomorrow, Carter. You won't see me again. What? I'm leaving, Carter. There's a big, wide world outside the lounge diner on the sunken patio on the hedge of rambling roses. That's where I'm going right now. And that's the place you'll only see through a gap in your mail-order blinkers. It's a lady's invitation. One last dance, eh? Ah. <laughs> Come on, then, love. The night is yet young. Let us dance it away in a haze of... Excuse me. What? Listen to me, sister. You've been hogging him all night, right? Well, now it's my turn to dance with old Mr. Dreamboat here, right? Linda Preston whipped me away. Jessie smiled. She waved as she reached the door. That was the last I saw of her. You mug! You sucker! Why didn't you run after her? Why didn't you fight? Why didn't you... Oh, my God! God, you bloody twerp! You chuff! You billock! All right, Carter. You can take me home now. You broke your duck last time, eh? Well, now it's time for your second innings. I took her home, and there on the sofa in the front parlour, among the damp fag ends, the spent matches, the cracked tiles, the crinkled, rotting flypaper, we coupled very quickly. Everyone was most upset about the news of Jessie Lewis's departure. Everyone except Pat. I'm not the least bit surprised, love. In fact, that's precisely the reason why I arranged for you to go to the social with her. Why? To show her up in her true colours. I knew what was going on. I knew you were secretly fancying her. I knew you was trying to pluck up the courage to ask her out. So I stepped in and did it for you. Thank you. I knew you'd see her in a true light when you got her on her own. I knew you'd see her as a scheming, heartless, selfish... Yeah, that's right, Pat, that's right. Any road. You're so disgusted with her behaviour and the way she's walked out on everyone that you've worked her completely out of your system. Am I right, Carter? That's right, Pat. That's right. By the way, what did you do after she'd gone and left you? Pardon? Oh, uh, <clears throat> I took Linda Preston home. Well... She said she wasn't feeling too good, you see, and I thought... Mm, Linda might as well. Preston! Mm. Now there's someone who'd make two of Jessie Lewis. Did she invite you in for coffee? That's right, Pat. That's right. We celebrated Christmas Day quietly. The two old men upstairs in the attic were constantly in our thoughts. Before we started Christmas dinner, my mother said a little prayer. Oh, Lord, for what we are about to receive, may the Lord make us truly thankful. Amen. Uh, pass us the bread sauce, Liz. I haven't uh, finished yet, Mort. Now close your eyes and put your hands together and take your cap off, will you? Sorry. Oh, Lord. Well, all I want to say, Lord, is as how I hope thou wilt look over our Stavely and Corporal Parkinson and give them the benefit of thy love and mercy. I know, Lord, they have sinned. Nobody knows that more than me. 
But then again, Lord, be fair. When all's said and done, we're all poor sinners when it gets down to brass tacks, aren't we? I mean, Lord, I were only saying to Mrs Talkington in the cake shop last week... Get that... on with it, woman. The bloody gravy's going stone cold. Well, to cut a long story short, Lord, all I want to say is I hope thou wilt have a happy Christmas and many of them. And if you can see your way to it, Lord, I hope as thou wilt not come down too hard on our Stavely and his oppo. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Uh, right then, let's get carving. Me belly's convinced me throat's been cut. After Christmas dinner, me mother suggested we all go upstairs to the attic to pay our respects. We took Daniel with us. The two old men lay still and silent in their beds. Stavely. Stavely. His eyelids fluttered, but his eyes didn't open. Stavely, love. Happy Christmas. Pum. Happy Christmas, Stavely. Ah, many of them, old lad. Look what we've brought you, Uncle Stavely. What is it? It's a baby, Stavely. It's Daniel. Oh, oh, take it away. Take it away at once. Now then, Stavely, oh. don't upset yourself, love. Daniel's oh. only oh. going to give you a kiss. Oh, no, no. Come on, Daniel, give your Uncle Stavely a kiss. What? There you are, Stavely. He likes you, does Daniel. Huh? He's giving you a nice, juicy smacker on the forehead. What are you doing now, Pom? Taking him to give Corporal Parkinson a kiss. Hey, no, no, don't. You're not to. It's an evil fluence. No, he's not, Stavely. He's only a baby. <laughs> he's only a harmless little bairn. <laughs> there now. He's kissed oh, Corporal Parkinson and all. Evil, evil. It's an evil fluence. Pat and me took Daniel back to the nursery. I held him in my arms. You'll be holding your own baby just like that one of these fine days, Carter. Are you looking forward to it? Mm. Will you be jealous, Daniel? Of course he won't, will you, Daniel? You'll be right good chums with our baby and you'll play together. But you mustn't be too rough because you'll be bigger than our little one. You'll be able to go walks together in country, Daniel. <laughs> And you'll pick flowers and dam streams and climb over stiles and roll down hills in grass and chuck sheep shite at each other. They'll do no such thing, Carter. They'll learn to have respect for the clothes. I mean to say, love, dry cleaning costs a small fortune these days. Pat went downstairs for supper. We were having pickled onions and Cheshire cheese. Daniel smiled at me. All right, Carter. Oh, singing, Daniel. Soaring. <laughs> Bloody hell. Oh, bloody hell. It must have been two weeks later when we first noticed the change in Uncle Stavely. He sat up in bed calling for condensed milk sandwiches and bottles of Vimto. We went upstairs to have a look. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Nice day. Pardon? Well, you're looking disgustingly healthy, I must say. <laughs> Pardon, I am. I saw his Corporal Parkinson. He says he's feeling very much better and he'll be shortly waking up to play his full part in the activities of the household. <laughs> Pardon? And then even stranger things began to happen. I took Daniel upstairs to see the two old boys. When Uncle Stavely saw him, he began to whimper. <laughs> Take him away! Take him away! But when I moved Daniel away, he cried out. No, bring him back! Bring him back! I brought him back. <laughs> Let him touch me. I lowered Daniel to his brow. The baby puckered his lips. Marvellous. Wonderful. Better, much better. <laughs> now I'll uh, do it to Corporal Parkinson. <laughs> From then on, I took Daniel to see them every day. And every day, their improvement continued apace. Stable is losing all his wrinkles. He's losing all the olives in his cheeks. He's losing the dewdrop on the end of his beak. It defies credence. It's Daniel what's doing it. You are? Ever since Daniel kissed them, they've been getting better. I tell you, it's Daniel who's doing it. Don't be so silly, Carter. I've never heard of anything so foolish in my life. Ah, it's not right dragging Thingy into it. Thingy? How many more times have I to tell you his name's Daniel? If you can't remember it, write it on the peak of your cap. I took Daniel back to the bedroom. It is you, isn't it, Daniel? You're the one what's doing it all. Now then, Carter, don't drag me into it. No, 
Oh, fair's fair, Daniel. Credit where credit's due. Don't be so bashful. Aye. Well, hmm. Don't take no notice of what they're saying downstairs. They don't understand things out the ordinary. <laughs> Look at all the things I do they don't understand. Such as? Pardon? What things do you do that are out of the ordinary? Well, you know, Daniel. <laughs> you know. I don't. I can't think of a single bloody thing. Hmm. Thank you very much. That's all I need. You've started on at me now. And so the weeks shuffled on. The wedding arrangements were confirmed. We had a chat with the vicar. His ears weren't all that big. Every day I took Daniel to see the two old men. They were blooming with good health. The hair began to grow again on Uncle Staveley's head. He resumed his semaphoring. And a stubble of hair appeared on Corporal Parkinson's pate too. And I think he's getting a new set of teeth. Do you? Well, he's dribbling a lot, and they normally do that when they're getting new choppers, don't they? I think it's marvellous. I think it's right champion to see the two of you looking so well, Staveley. Oh, you look very well yourself. <laughs> oh, thank you, Staveley. We all of us feel right champion. There's none of us had a cold so far this winter, and Les hasn't had a moment's trouble with his piles. It was true. We all felt as fit as ferrets. Pat noticed it too. One evening, when we were choosing draft excluder for the master bedroom, she said, I've never seen you look so fit, Carter. You've even started taking an interest in the curtains for the lounge diner. Hmm. It's funny, but every time I go to your house, I seem to feel better myself. When I call round in the evening after work, I often feel right shattered. But as soon as I set foot in your house, I feel right booked up. <laughs> it's a strange feeling. When I got home, I was met on the front doorstep by my mother. She was in a right panic. It's the two old men upstairs, Carter. There's trouble, love. Big trouble. I followed her upstairs into the attic. Oh, thank God you've come. She wouldn't show us till you'd arrived, and I've got a snooker match in half an hour. Aye, and I've got to buy a new ferrule for my walking stick. Look at them, Carter. What do you think to them? I looked. Well, they were a strange sight right enough. Uncle Staveley's skin had lost all its wrinkles. The curve had gone from his spine. The whites of his eyes glowed and shone. But it was Corporal Parkinson who took the eye. He had now got seven teeth, and his head was covered with a tangle of auburn ringlets. Well...
They certainly look a bit rum, don't they? You call that rum? You haven't seen out yet. Just look at this. She went up to Corporal Parkinson's bed and whipped back the sheets. There. Look at that. Mm. Strew. Bloody hell. He's grown a new pair of legs. It's our Lil's baby what's done that to uh, Pump. He's the one that's making us better. I think he should be allowed to visit us twice a day and then we'll be completely cured. He <laughs> sure do I. Ye gods, it's Corporal Parkinson. He started to talk. We went downstairs to the back parlour. We looked at each other and for a while we didn't say a word. Then my mother said... We can't call a doctor. That's out of the question. Aye. Not a soul outside these four walls must know about this. Oh, the scandal of it. We've never had anything like this in the family before. Aye. If a word of this leaks out, I'll be blackballed from the snooker club for life. Just then there was a knock at the door. I opened it. There was a man stood there. He held our dog in his arms. Is this yours? Uh, yes. I didn't stand a chance. He ran right out in front of the car. Oh. Is he dead? No, he's still breathing. I think you ought to call the vet. We did. He said there weren't much hope. We decided to keep him while mourning to see how he got on. Oh, Rover. Poor old Rover. Why didn't you look where you were going? Naughty dog. Naughty. I left the room for a moment. When I came back, I had Daniel in my arms. I bent down over the dog. I pressed Daniel's lips to his head. Oh, my God! No! No! All that evening we stayed by the dog's side. We covered him in blankets and put our water bottle to his back. He didn't stir. At midnight we went to bed heavy of heart. At two o'clock Uncle Mort shook me by the shoulder. Carter! Carter! Wake up! What's up? It's the dog. I can hear it moving. We went downstairs. When I pushed open the door of the front parlour, the dog stood up stiffly. It wagged its tail and crawled on its belly to my feet. Struth, Carter. Struth. Good dog. There's a good dog. My mother and father appeared at the door. My mother clasped her hand to her mouth. Dear Lord, have mercy on us. Next morning, I'd only been at work a couple of hours when Sid Skellorn gave me a message. Uh, from your mother, Carter. Uh, she's been on the phone. Uh, she says we've got to go home. Is it urgent? Not really. Uh, it's just that Daniel's gone missing. Oh, God almighty! Uh, you don't worry, Carter. I'll dispose of your next sandwiches for you. I drove like a maniac back home. They'd caught police in. There was a radio van with a blue flashing light. I only left him out in the pram for half an hour. It couldn't have been a second more than that. And when I went down for him, he disappeared. Now then, now then, Ali, don't let's start the old waterworks again. Now don't let's panic. Uh, right, Carter, get yourself out in your car and do a swift tour of the streets. He can't have got far. I drove around for an hour. There was no sight of him. I only left him out in the pram for a quarter of an hour. It couldn't have been a second. More than that. Bloody business all this, isn't it? I'm going to be at least an hour late for me fives and threes match. The afternoon came and went, but there was no sign of Daniel. I went into the back garden. There was a bitter east wind. It scoured the streets and rattled the slates on the roofs. What a mess, eh, Daniel? You can say that again, Carter. Where the bloody hell are you, any road? Aye, well, Carter... This is where all this conversation between you and me falls down, isn't it? It's no use in a situation like this, is it? Aye, you're right there, Daniel. I went back into the house and sat down in the front parlour. I only left him out in the street for five minutes. It couldn't have been a second more than that. Give that dog a kick up the backside, will you, Mort? It's done now bar scratch at door all night. It wants to go walk, is. So do I. I opened the door, but the dog didn't go out. It turned to me. It wagged its tail and slowly began to hobble up the stairs. It waited till we all started to follow it. It took a long time to reach the attic. It scratched at the door and turned to us and wagged its tail again. Go on then, Carter. Shove the door open. I opened the door. The dog squeezed past me and made for Uncle Stavely. Keep it away. Keep it away, Bob. It brushed past Uncle Stavely. It lay on the floor and pointed with its nose under Corporal Parkinson's bed. It thumped its tail. 
I crouched down and pulled out a bundle. Bloody hell! It's thingy! We fed Daniel and bathed him and we put him to bed. Then we held a family conference. We just wanted to make a protest, Pom. Protest? What are you talking about? About Daniel. We think we should work out a timetable so that everyone gets his fair share of holding him, Pom. Do you think we ought to call a doctor after all? We ought to punch the noses in and send them packing back to the bloody old folks' home. No, hey, we can't do that. For a kick-off, they'd never understand about Corporal Parkinson's legs, would they? I suppose not. Next day, I prepared to take Daniel up to the attic. No, Carter. Not tonight. Why not? Because he is never going up there again no more. I'm its father, and I'm putting an embargo on it entering the attic in perpetuity, or whichever comes sooner. And so the decision was reached. Never again would Daniel be taken to see the two old men. You're signing our death warrant, Pop. Where is he? Where's Daniel? For a short time, the two old men held their own. But then slowly and surely the decline set in. Corporal Parkinson lost his ringlets. The wrinkles returned to Uncle Stavely's face and the dewdrop returned to the end of his nose. Sometimes I was able to smuggle Daniel upstairs to them. Carter more, give me more. I'm sorry, Uncle Stavely. I daren't keep him here any longer. Oh dear, oh dear. Pum. Downstairs, my mother sat in the back parlour and sobbed. Oh, oh, it's awful, dreadful. Fancy having to sentence your own brother-in-law to death. I've never done that before. We've done right, Annie. <laughs> Well, at least you have. It was entirely your decision, wasn't it? Oh, it's awful. <laughs> Terrible. Now, then, Annie, look, don't fret yourself. We've made the correct decision. Uh, at least you have. It was entirely your decision, wasn't it? The weather turned wicked and angry. The hills above the high moorlands were snarled and bruised. The canal was frozen over. Red wings and field fares died. I signed all the forms for the house. Happy, Carter. Happy, darling. Hmm. Only a week to go to the wedding. And after that, there's a lifetime together, Carter. Isn't it romantic? I wonder if the underfelt will last all that time. That afternoon, I took Daniel out for a walk. There were sharp tongues of ice in the east wind. It chilled you to the marrow. It was the last walk I ever made with him. Now, don't keep him out too long, Carter. And keep him well wrapped up. Right. I pushed the pram along the banks of the cut. I walked quickly. The pram bucked and bounced. Hey up, Carter. Careful. You'll have me out ass over dick. Oh, sorry. Hey up, Daniel. You know what I got in my pocket? No. Two hundred quid. In fivers. Pat gave it me to pay for carpets. Two hundred niggery? Aye. We could do a lot with that, eh, Daniel? We could get out of this bloody place and be free. We could buy a horse and caravan. We could travel the length and breadth of the country. We, we'd stick up a sign on the side of the caravan, Daniel the Wonder Healer, and we'd go round these market towns. And I'd stand at the door of the caravan and I'd thump this bloody great drum and I'd shout at the top of my voice, Roll up, roll up, come and be cured by Daniel the Wonder Healer. <laughs> we'd be laughing, Daniel. We'd make a fortune. People would come flocking to us to be cured. There'd be hunchbacks and cripples, there'd be lunatics, there'd be old people on crutches, there'd be blind people with white sticks, there'd be people with squints and people with limps, there'd be sad-eyed husbands, there'd be wild-eyed wives, there'd be women with blonde hair, ash grey at the tips. And I'd stand in front of them and I'd shout at the top of my voice, Come and see Daniel, the wonder healer, the only known cure for being brassed off with life. What do you say to that, eh, Daniel? Rubbish. What? You haven't got the guts to do a thing like that. Pardon? You haven't, have you? Have you? No. You've not got the mouse to do out as positive as that, have you? No. When you get down to brass tacks, Carter, you can't raise the energy to do a single positive thing in life, can you? No. Never mind all that. Just think of the goodies in store for you. It's a life of lounge diners for you now. It's a life of loft conversions and vacuum extensions. 
It's a life of boredom. Comforting, soothing, singing, soaring boredom. Aye. Aye, you're right there, Daniel. Hey, up, Carter. You'd best get me home, lad. I'm soaked to the bloody skin. It's been boring cats and dogs this last half hour. Oh, God, Daniel. Oh, hell. I rushed him home. It was too late. He caught pneumonia. They put him in an oxygen tent, but he died three days later. It were a sad little funeral. We had boiled ham sandwiches, but the individual trifles weren't up to much. I went out into the back garden. Snowflakes fell on my shoulders. A flock of mute swans flapped slowly overhead. A locomotive hooted in the distance. Never mind, E. Carter. What's that? I said, never mind, Carter. At least you did something positive in your life, didn't you? What's that? You bloody killed me, you big soft tatter. I looked up into the scowling sky. I shrugged my shoulders. I grunted twice and then I skulked off back to the house. We usually do in our part of the world. In A Touch of Daniel by Peter Sinniswood, Carter Brandon was played by Christian Rodger, Pat by Stephanie Turner, Mrs Brandon by Liz Smith, Mr Brandon by...